Year is 1990. I'm sitting in a courtroom and I'm very concerned about the outcome. You see, the man on trial attacked my wife and actually kidnapped her and took her to another room in the building that she worked. I was sitting there and I was watching the closing arguments. And when the defense attorney got up, he said, I grew up at a local lake. And we used to have people that would tell us they touched the bottom of Twin Lakes. But we had a way to prove that they actually did do what they said they did. They had to bring up a handful of sand. And that was his arguments. They don't have the sand. When the district attorney got up and started his closing arguments, he said, you know, we've got better than sand. We had people on the bottom of the lake to watch and see if they touched it. He was convicted because of the evidence. And what I want to do tonight as we talk about the theories, the false theories about the resurrection, I want to try to give you some evidence and let you make the conclusion yourself. And so as we do that, I want to, I want to first tell you something that somebody read, that somebody wrote in a book, Josh McDowell, he wrote The Resurrection Factor. And here's what Josh said. He's, a tremendous, he did, he's done a tremendous amount of investigation about the resurrection, the uniqueness of the Bible. And he said, many theories have been advanced attempting to show the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a fraud. I believe that many of the people who came up with these theories must have had two brains, one lost and the other one looking for it. Historians have come to the conclusion that the events of this happened and there's too much evidence to prove otherwise. What does the Bible say? Over 40 times in the New Testament, the word resurrection is used. The majority of those times is in, in context with Christ and His resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, our theme of our meeting here. Uh, chapter 15, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 27, and verse 31, and coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Acts chapter 4, and verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Acts chapter 17 and verse 18. Then the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be proclaimer of a foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again, verses 5 through 8. And that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater portion remain until this present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and then all the apostles. And last, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. And then in verse 14 of that same chapter. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Something happened to the apostles and to the disciples after the resurrection. We know when Jesus was arrested, they fled. As we talked about yesterday, a couple of disciples that really weren't known very well. Joseph and Nicodemus stepped forward and, and got the body of Jesus and buried him. But most of his closest associates were scared. Some of them even went back to work. They went back to do what they did before. Jesus had predicted, I'm going to be raised. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and be sacrificed and be crucified, and I'm going to raise again the third day. But somehow they just didn't connect the dots. Well, there's a lot of theories 
and we can't get into them for our time. I cannot believe, Ryan, can you believe preachers got through in 15 minutes? That was amazing. I was keeping time because I was going to see if they had any extra time I could take it, um, but I won't do that. <clears throat> my wife sometimes picks up my outlines, and I have them sitting on the back table as people come in. They grab my outline, and they know what I'm going to be preaching. When my wife picks up my outline, and she sees that it's a front and back, she starts getting scared. Because normally the front page is enough. Well, I have three pages. <laughs> she would be scared, but I'm going to go through it pretty fast. I can talk very pretty fast. The first theory I want us to mention tonight is one of probably the most common, and it's called the swoon theory. Let me read to you the definition of that. Jesus did not really die. He only swooned or fainted. Therefore, the disciples saw only a revived or resuscitated Christ. Christ was nailed to the cross and suffered from shock, pain, the loss of blood, but instead of actually dying, he only fainted from exhaustion. When he was placed in the tomb, he was still alive, and the disciples mistook him for being dead. They buried him alive. After several hours, he revived in the coolness of the tomb, and he arose and departed. That's the swoon theory. And would you believe there are people who actually believe that? Um, above what the scriptures tell. In John chapter 16 and verse 6, it says, But he said to them, this is the person at the tomb, says, But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they had laid him. We know when we studied yesterday as Joseph went and it says he, he took the body off of the cross and he took and laid that body into the tomb. It was a body. It was a lifeless body. The soul had departed and, and was in paradise. The Bible tells us in John chapter 20, verses 5 through 8, And he stooped down and looked in and he saw the linen cloths laying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief which was about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came into the tomb first went in also and he saw and he believed. The linen cloths, as, as we can look at this and, and, and kind of see and speculate, and as Steve suggested, this is not in a vacuum. These are real life events that took place. The linen cloths, and, and, and if you remember back in the case of Lazarus, when Lazarus arose, he was still wrapped all up. The cloth that had wrapped up Jesus was just laying there. It was laying there on the slab as if the body went out of it. The handkerchief was off in a different spot. Oh, oh Jesus would have had to unwrap himself if he had come to in that situation, uh, if he had just fainted or passed out for a little bit of time. But there's other, something else, and Steve mentioned this yesterday, and I thought about it when he said it. You know, you had someone who was an expert at death, the centurion. He had seen many people die. He had seen others who had been injured and was able to help them maybe in some way take them to get medical attention. Um, but, but he knew death. He, he was an expert at death. And when he was asked about it, yes, he was dead. When the spear was thrust in the side of Jesus and forthwith came water and blood, he was dead. All of the scourging that he had taken, the beating, he couldn't even carry the cross to where he was going to be crucified. He didn't have the strength. He did not have the power, the energy. Yes, Jesus truly, truly died. And that's part of what we have in our study is his death. Because of his death, and as he was buried and then he raised again, it is the pinnacle point of what we believe. And as we mentioned, we'll mention that again in a minute. So that was the first one. The second thing is the hallucination theory. This is an interesting one. This theory says that all of Christ's post-resurrection appearances were only supposed appearances. Um, because actually, the people who saw him, and we read the numbers of people that saw him 500 at one time, they were just hallucinating. They wanted to see him, but they just hallucinated that this was Jesus. But when you read a little bit further in Mark chapter 16, verse 11, down through verse 16, it says, When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, 
they did not believe. And that's an important statement. One of the things that we'll talk about here in just a second about the hallucination from a psychiatrist's view um, is there's an expectation of seeing. There, there's, a, there's an expectation that they thought Jesus was still alive. Well, they thought he was dead. They wouldn't even believe the people who came back to them and said, we have seen the risen Savior. They didn't believe it. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. <laughs> okay, so the women have come and said, we've seen Jesus. They didn't believe them, which was understandable. They, they didn't really put much precedent in women in that day. Y'all understand that because of the traditions and the customs of the day. But now here you have some men that come in and, and, and here's some validity here. The men say, hey, we've seen him. They didn't believe them either. After that, he, um, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat in the table. And notice what Jesus does. And he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, we know this verse, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, but he that does not believe will be condemned. You know, as you think about that, we, you know, we quote those verses, don't we, a lot? But, but you notice what Jesus is saying before. He is condemning them because of their unbelief. They had been told Jesus had risen. Jesus said, I'm going to arise. They were told that. So for them to have hallucinations about Jesus is totally ludicrous. Now listen to what psychiatrists say. Only certain kinds of, types of, kinds of people, types of people have hallucinations. These are usually very high strung, high imaginative, and very nervous people. In fact, usually only paranoid and schizophrenic individuals have hallucinations. But Jesus appeared to many different types of people. His appearances were not restricted to people of any particular psychological makeup. Hallucinations are linked to an individual's subconsciousness, to a particular past experience. And this is certainly not part of their past experience. I don't really see really good peripherally. I know Steve tried that too. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, I know, I know. I, I'm moving on. Okay, um, the, the next one is the impersonation theory. This view is that the appearances were not really Christ at all, but someone impersonating him. Um, <laughs> Can you imagine that? I noticed recently at one of the golf tournaments there was somebody that was impersonating Tiger Woods and they were having a big thing of it because he was going around acting like that. Can you imagine these men had spent three years with Jesus and them not know the real thing? Um, what do you do about Thomas in that case? The impersonator had the actual holes in his hands and in his side. Does it make sense? The disciples were reluctant, reluctant to believe the resurrection, and doubtfully, they had to be convinced. Now, when somebody who steps up who claims to be Jesus, if that's the case, you think they would buy that. I just don't see it happening. And then there's the spiritual resurrection theory. We'll hurry and go through. This view is that Christ's re resurrection was not a real physical resurrection. Again, what do you do with Thomas? You know, put your hands here. Touch the holes. Touch the si my side doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. The theft theory. Somebody stole the body. Somebody has stolen the body of Jesus. Well, who would have stolen it? Okay. The disciples didn't steal it because they didn't even know he, res he was resurrected. They didn't. If they had the body, they would know. Okay, you, they're making a lot of stuff up out here. We got the body. We know. No. The, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders didn't steal the body because guess what they would have done? They would have produced it. He hasn't resurrected. Here's the body. Again, a theory that doesn't hold water. And then I think there's one more I had on here. You think about the theft theory. How many of you, how many of you would die for a lie? These men started dying because of what they believed about the resurrection. And then there's the unknown tomb theory. And this is the last one that I put down because of time's sake. Um, it's one of the earliest theories, um, and, and they just didn't know where the tomb was. Well, when Joseph went to the tomb, it was close by in the garden. We talked about that yesterday. Mary had followed him. The disciples knew where the tomb was. They went to the tomb. The Roman soldiers knew where the tomb was. The Pharisees knew where the tomb was. They went and sealed the tomb, put the guard to it. The Romans would keep records of that. Oh, that, they knew where the tomb was. 
So it couldn't have been the wrong tomb that they went to that happened to be empty. Um, again, all of these are theories. The, the best explanation that we can find is as we started out with. And he was buried and he rose again according the third day according to the scriptures. Who do we believe? We believe the scriptures. There might be someone here this, this evening who is not a child of God. And maybe you've heard something tonight that has made you think about your condition. It, it is of the utmost importance. It is of eternal importance that you understand that unless you are a child of God, unless you are an heir to his family, that you'll be separated from all eternity from God. And you do that by simple obedience to the gospel. What we're talking about this week, obedience to God's will. Follow what the instructions are that the Bible gives us. We must hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. Um, and when you think about that, understanding that hearing that word produces a belief. And that's what Jesus was saying, unless you believe. He that believes will be rewarded. He that do not believe will be condemned. We must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We must be willing to repent of our sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. We must be willing to confess him. We must be able to stand up, kind of like Joseph went and got that body, and others who were willing to stand up and say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. But the scary one is verse 33. If you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. And then we must be buried with him in baptism. That's where we come in contact with the blood, Acts 2.38. What must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. What Paul was told in, in Acts 22.16. Why tarry thou? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. And then that begins the journey on our walk with God. And then we remain faithful, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. We're going to sing a song of invitation this evening. And if we can help you in any way, if you're subject to the invitation, need the prayers of these good men here at this congregation, we want to ask you to come while we sing this song and let that be known. Please come.